Welcome to Everyday Linux User. In today's video, I'll be reviewing Pop OS. So uh, let's have a look at Pop OS. So here is the Pop OS website. Um, it's produced by System76, who produce laptops and desktop servers and other PCs. Um, so um, this is their own version of Linux uh, that they ship for those PCs and you can download it and install it on yours which I have done and that's what this review is going to be about so uh, it says pop OS is an operating system for STEM I'm not sure what STEM stands for and creative professionals who use their computer as a tool to discover and create unless unleash your potential and secure reliable open source software based on your exceptional curiosity we sense you have a lot of it um, and this video is on the front page and tells you about workspaces, keyboard navigation, stacking, um, auto tiling and workflow customization. Uh, and it talks about deep learning engineering by so it's definitely geared towards um, more than just your average desktop user. Um, but this is a desktop review. Uh, it's got stuff for gaming here. Um, do not serve hybrid graphics got dark mode it's got stuff for raspberry pi on the website as well so why are we reviewing pop os so i like to use distro watch as a guide to see which distributions are out there and i'm gradually working my way down this ranking list now this ranking list based on the amount of people that come to this website and click on a particular distribution so um, I've got reviews for MX Linux, Endeavor, Mint, Manjaro. Um, I've noticed that Fedora is now popped above Pop OS in the list, um, but at the point of downloading, Pop OS was above Fedora. So that's why I've done a Pop OS now. Um, it's a Debian-based distribution or Ubuntu-based. Pop OS is made for sort of like mass production on laptops and desktops and stuff like that. So it's it's, it's supposed to be a good desktop operating system. Um, so under that you've got Ubuntu, which I've got a review for that, and then we've got Debian, Lite, and OpenSUSE, which I haven't got um, reviews for yet, um, but they will be in the future. Um, so that's why we're doing Pop OS. So if we look at Pop OS from a usability point of view, um, it's the desktop based on GNOME, um, but it isn't. Um, pure GNOME, uh, I think they call it Cosmos. Um, and main differences are, well, obviously you haven't got the panel down the left, you've got it at the bottom, which you can do with GNOME anyway. Um, but you've got these, uh, the applications window is probably the key difference here. Instead of it exploding across the entire screen like it does with GNOME, it's this nice little box. Um, and you can see you've got these tabs here and it enables so you've got all the stuff here but you can break it down to office system utilities and what you can do is create your own one so if you had one called games you could create a folder called games let's do that and then if i install games i could put them in that folder there so um very easy to use um to connect to the internet, um, a bit weird this one. You can see here I've got an internet connection. It's an ethernet connection. You think clicking on that would enable you to do stuff with your network. It doesn't. You have to click in this right hand window up here. And you can see uh, Wi-Fi, wired is connected and Wi-Fi is not. But if I wanted to, I could click on that and then select a network. And you can see my wi uh, Wi-Fi networks are available, which good means my hardware is working properly and it's picked up. Um, I am in light mode for the desktop, but you can customize various features of the desktop. It's not as customizable as um, XFCE or KDE, um, but I don't think it's supposed to be for this Pop OS. I think Pop OS is designed for, you know, similar to MacBook users. You turn it on, you use it, you're supposed to use it um, as a functional computer, like if you're doing Linux gaming, or if you want to use it for your office suite, whatever. Uh, this isn't for tinkerers. I don't think this is for users. So um, for basics, you can um, change the wallpaper, right click, 
um, and you can do change background here and there are various options available um, for instance like that I'm going to leave it as the default pop OS one it's not bad So there are other um, things. You can add your own pictures in here, by the way. Uh, click Add Picture, and then you can just go to your Pictures folder and add one in if you've got one. I haven't got any on here at the minute. Um, desktop options. <coughs> so desktop options. Um, so pressing the super key opens the launcher. So if I press the, uh, that can be your Windows key, um, whatever the key is on your particular keyboard. And what that does is if I hide this window, here and press the win key it comes up with a launcher so say i want to launch firefox just type firefox and you can see firefox comes up if you want to say office it'll bring up all the office applications so that's what that does um you can change it um pressing the super key opens a windows and workspace view um so if i change that there and now press the super key you can see all your open windows and the workspaces that they're on. Pressing the escape key gets you out of that. Uh, or pressing the super key opens the applications overview. Um, I can tell you this. Um, you can leave it on launcher. And if you want to see the application, you should press the win and A key at the same time. And that's that does the same thing. The windows and E key brings up your email program. Windows and F brings up your file manager. Uh, you can enable top left corner as a hotspot for workspaces. Um, so the interesting thing about this, if I if I do that now, I can do that and it will bring up your workspaces. I've already got workspaces as an option, so I could also click on workspaces and it's going to do the same thing. So it doesn't seem much point around the hot corner, um, but you can choose whether to have the workspaces button shown or not so if I do that now I can still have that as shown my workspaces but without having the menu option similarly um, you've got a show applications button here which is this one up here so uh, the hotspot can get very annoying quite quickly uh, applications will bring up that but you can also press this button here and that will also bring up the applications or as you've seen earlier Windows A also brings up applications so you could, if you want, turn off applications here and that will leave your top bar quite empty. And you can also change where you put the time. So now I've got rid of everything, I put the time in the top left corner and it leaves the whole top bar clear. Uh, you can also put it in the top right if you want to, I will recenter it. Um, and window controls, um, you can choose whether you see um, the maximize button or not. You can see here, I haven't. Um, if I want to maximize this window, I double click the title bar. Um, but um, for people that want to have a maximize button, you can do that and then you can see it appears. So uh, they're good uh, desktop options. If we look at the appearance, we've um, got two options, got light or dark. Um, I'm on light mode. This is dark mode for, I know a lot of people do like dark mode. Um, um, I prefer light mode and uh, my vision is not so great so dark mode for me I find difficult to to look at and I'll be honest I don't particularly like that wallpaper even though you can change it um, so I'm going to stick to light mode for the video apologies for anyone who gets blinded by that um, then we've got the dock options um, one you can choose whether you have the dock or not so you can turn it off um, for people that don't want to dock. Um, what that means is if you've got rid of your applications at the top, you've now got nothing to bring that up unless you just print Windows and A at the same time. Which, So if you're not going to have the dock, I would recommend leaving the applications in the top left corner. Um, I like the dock. Uh, you can make the dock full length like that. Um, I find that takes up too much real estate. 
Um, you can show the launch icon in the dock, which is this button here. And that's the same as pressing the Windows key on your keyboard. Um, show workspaces icon in the dock, um, which is this button here. So likewise, if uh, you can either choose to have both workspaces here and in the top left corner or have it in one or the other, I wouldn't recommend getting it away from both um, things because otherwise you won't be able to bring it up easily. Uh, show the applications in the dock, that's this button here. Again, if you'd left the applications up there, you see how annoying the hotspot is as soon as I go up there, boom. Uh, show mounted drives. Um, I haven't got any drives mounted, but I'm going to mount one now. And what you can see is that's appeared there. I've got a new volume. And if I open that, it shows all the files on that new volume. Uh, the dock visibility, always visible. Um, that's what I've got it set to, always hide. But as soon as you go down there, it comes up. Um, intelligently hide is when you place a screen over it. And you can choose which, if you've got multiple displays, you might have the dock on one display, but not the other. So I'm going to keep mine always visible. And then you can choose the dock size. Uh, so at the moment, this is medium size, which is 48 pixels. Small is like that, takes up less screen estate, or you can be ridiculous, have a large, and you can be even more ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, for those, um, for, you know, I mean, if you're partially sighted, that might be a, a good thing to do. So I'm going to put that back to um, default. Uh, position on the screen, you can change. Um, so at the moment, it's at the bottom. You can make it along the left if you prefer the um, GNOME view, or you can have it on the right. And it's up to you where you put it. So whilst it's um, not like XFCE, it's got lots of widgets and stuff like that, it is customizable enough so you can tweak things to make them work the way you want them to. And you can choose the dock alignment along the screen. So if I have it on the left-hand side, uh, centre is there, and then you've got top or bottom. Whereas if you have the bottom of the screen, um, end is to the right, start is to the left, and then centre is in the middle. And then you've got workspaces, um, automatically remove. You can add a fixed number of workspaces. And if you fix the number of workspaces, you can see how many there are. So I've put four. If I go over there now, you can see I've got four workspaces. And you've got multi-monitor support and placement of the workspace picker on the left-hand side or the right-hand side. So now this is going to look strange because I've got the hotspot on the left, but the workspace comes up on the right. So that's your desktop settings. Um, there are um, other settings. Uh, you can see the Wi-Fi here, um, also network settings, uh, I'm connected. There you can set up a VPN. Notification options, um, you can have do not disturb mode on, or you can have lock screen notifications over there on. So a bit of a notification appears for your lock screen or not. So let's look at um, the applications that are installed by default. There's, there, there aren't many, uh, you've got, a, but there's enough to, to get you going. So you've got Firefox, which is your web browser. Um, you've got a weather app. You've got a terminal. Uh, this is a simple screen recorder I installed for recording this video. It got a calculator, a calendar, contact book. You've got the file manager, which is the standard um, one that comes with GNOME. You've got the settings app, text editor. Um, so there, there isn't much there. Uh, under the office section, you've got LibreOffice. Under system, you've got disk use analyzer and power statistics, startup applications, etc. And then under utilities, you've got a few utilities like your launches, your image viewers. Um, the, the video app is installed. So I can click on that. Uh, so this is a video I created showing how to set up POP. So if I click that, is it going to run? Uh, the specified movie cannot be found. Let's see if I can actually find a movie to launch. Ouch, that's not good at all. <laughs> and so you saw there that I had a problem with the video app. Um, 
we'll try it again. Um, in case it was just a glitch. I'll be honest, I've had problems with this video up before with GNOME. Add local video. And click that. No, it's not going to play it. So um, as you can see, there, there weren't many apps installed by default. Um, luckily, we have the pop shop. And this is how you install applications. Uh, it's worth looking here to look at your software sources. Uh, so, as you can see, it's Ubuntu based. Um, so, you can see this is where it's getting its um, software from. And it's got these things on. But it's worth noticing Flatpak here is turned on. So, you can install Flatpaks. And there's some extra sources as well um, Pop OS, proprietary applications, and release sources. And the good news about that is it's very easy to install popular software, as I will show you now. Uh, so if I search up here, we can already see Spotify and Chrome are both available. So click install on Chrome. It doesn't actually ask for a password. You can just install it. Um, and the same with Spotify. And Visual Studio Code is also up there. So we'll leave those to install. Well, that's th three applications, three common applications. I didn't have to even go searching for them. They're there. Uh, what I do need is an audio application. So go to there. It's not the fastest application in the world. Um, I think you probably need um, a more powerful PC than the one I'm using. This one's got four gig of RAM. Um, it, it was fine for most other distros. This is a little bit slow on here. I think GNOME does that. And whilst this isn't pure GNOME, it is it's so much based on GNOME. I think it's probably using a lot of resources. Um, I don't think we need that anymore, Flash Player. But he, these are some of the audio um, Packages are audacious. Let's see what we can find. So with the box is available. Um, interestingly, there's two. I assume one is and one isn't the flat pack. So let's click into it. Can you click into it to see what it is? You can. So you can click into any of these. And it's, um, so it's GNOME 170, uh, 17.5 meg, like that. And if I go back. Double click on this one, and this is 675 meg. Uh, this has to be the flat pack, has to be. It's annoying that it doesn't tell you um, whether it is flat pack or if it is telling you, it's not telling you easily. I don't know if I can click on that little eye there. But anyway, um, sensible person would click the one that's got the smallest download size. So that's what I'm going to do. And uh, so that's doing that now. Um, you might have seen that down here. Chrome said it's finished installing. Now that's interesting that it's asked for my password this time. Uh, Spotify is finished installing down there. So let's look at Chrome. Does it work? It's slow. It's got to be said, it's very slow. Uh, so I can make Chrome my default browser. And there we go. So as you can see, um, Chrome works. Um, before we start Spotify, what I want to do is turn on a Bluetooth speaker. So I've got a Bluetooth speaker on, and what we're going to do is try and connect the Bluetooth. So click there, Bluetooth settings. As you can see in the background, Visual Studio Code has now been installed. 
So I know from previous uh, video um, that I did that cylinder BT is the one that we're needing. So I'm going to connect to that. It says connected. Right, it's done that straight away. So now if I go to Spotify, and I can use the launcher here for that. Whilst we're waiting for that, we will also install VLC. And you can see that you can search for applications as well as looking through the list. Um, again, two options. That was 28.5 meg. I'm just going to assume this one's a flat pack. It's 745. So there's a huge difference between uh, a flat pack and the non flat packs. I'm going to install the non flat pack. Interesting, Spotify is not doing very much. Uh, this authentication is because I'm installing VLC. If you install in flat packs, it doesn't ask for your password, but if you aren't, then it seems that it, let, um, it does ask for your password. I'm going to close Spotify and reopen it, Let's see if that makes it any better. All I could also do is, what we will do is open with the box, and what we're trying to do here is, oh, you can see that um, Spotify is now lo um, loaded properly. So let's minimize that. Um, we're going to log into Spotify. So I can listen to this rock thing and see if it comes out of the Bluetooth speaker. And it does. So Spotify's working. Um, let's try rhythm box. And you can see it's now adding music into my library. And you can see if that works or not. Oh, let's do rabbit. Rabbit, rabbit, rabbit. So that worked. So we'll pause that, um, cancel that now. Um, so um, VLC, did that install? It did. And so we should be able to open that video from earlier. And you can see it's actually You can see it's actually loaded the video okay. So that's working. Um, let's see what else we can install. Let's install some games, shall we? So first off, some Steam, if I can type. Uh, it's the flat pack that you're getting. Interestingly, it's actually saying it's a flat pack this time, um, but it's giving you a choice. You can install the Debian package. Uh, I think I'm going to... Um, let's go for the Debian package. It says 2.4 meg. So that's doing that. Let's install something else as well. We'll go for. Let's go for Lutris. So Lutris helps you install and play video games from all eras, from basically by leveraging combining existing emulators. So let's install that. Now that says 1.6 gig. Compared with. 
I don't know. It's not actually saying, but I guess the feeling's going to be a lot smaller. So we're going to go for the Debian package. So whilst that's doing that, let's have a look at the printer situation. So um, we'll go into settings. Presumably there's a printer option down here. There is, and you can see it's already found my printer. So in theory, I should be able to go into Office, for instance, go into Writer, Um, turn it off. Um, so we'll say. So go to the print option, and you can see it's picked up my printer. When I click print, it's gonna hopefully do it, and I confirm it did indeed do that. So um, we're still waiting for um, Steam, I think. No, oh, Steam's there. So if we run that, it should do the update in the background. It is. So we'll leave that doing that. I'm not sure if Lutris is finished yet. And what we can do with Steam is we can put it into our games thing. And we could actually add one of these called Media. Uh, so now you can put rhythm box into media, you can put Spotify into media, and you can put VLC into media. And then you create another one called development. And you can put Visual Studio into there. And then you can have another one called web. We're going to put Chrome into there. We're going to put Firefox into there. And we're going to put the mail program into there. So um, that's how easy it is to use this um, applications thing. Um, to add to this dock at the bottom, you should be able to just drag it in like this, which you can, and you can unpin the one you don't want. So in this case, I've now put Chrome there. Steam is now updating. I'm not sure what's happened to Lutris. It seems to have got lost. Oh no, Lutris is now here as well. Interesting, it doesn't have a proper icon. Let's have a look at system performance. Now obviously we've got a couple of things running, so that's going to have an effect, but we can go into settings. Uh, no, we don't want settings. What we want to do is go into the utilities and we want to go into system, perhaps. And there we've got system monitors. So we can click on the system monitor. And you can see here what's being used. So 95% of my CPU, almost 100% each at this moment in time. Well, 1.6 gig of actual memory and swap are being used. So memory's fine, it's the CPU usage that is through the roof and the processes it's using the CPU now we've got Steam the video recording's using some it is doing it, it's just a little bit slow because there's so many things using up the CPU now I'm not a big PC gamer so I haven't got much in the way of games here um, I've got Grand Theft Auto, so I can install that probably. And this is it available for Windows only. This is one of those you can use for Proton. So I've installed Steam, and from Steam I've installed Grand Theft Auto. Um, I've also installed Lutris, which is another gaming platform. And you can see I've so Lutris um, has. Uh, good old games. Um, you've also got the Epic Game Store if you've got an Epic Games account. Uh, Origin, Ubisoft, Steam. You can do all sorts of things on this one. 
And I've also got Steam installed. Um, so from Steam, I installed Grand Theft Auto. And we'll try and load that. Uh, so um, Grand Theft Auto didn't work on this PC. And when I run um, Sensible Soccer, it does some weird things with the... Um, but it opens full screen. So I'm going to see if I can get it to stop doing that. So uh, within Lutris itself, I can find the Sensible World of Soccer and there's a configure option here. Uh, restore resolution on game exit, I think that <laughs> we probably need. It'd be good if you could open the game in window in a windowed mode. So the other type of app that I would use um, obviously is a video editor. So we can search for video editors. And you can see you've got OpenShot, um, but the one I want is Caden Live. Even though this is um, GNOME and OpenShot would be more suitable, I just prefer Caden Live. So I'm going to install that now. And again, you can install it from Flatpak or Debian. So 800 meg for Flatpak and the Debian. Is 147, so we're going to go for the Debian one. For those that are interested, if you're using flat packs, um, you're using a containerized app, which means um, you get all the libraries and everything built in with the app, and everything's contained to when you're running the app. So nothing can interfere with the libraries. So if I installed another piece of software, it's not going to uh, mess up that application. When you're installing a dev package, you're sharing libraries with um, lots of other applications. So if an application updates a library that your application can't run with, then potentially it could cause that application to have a failure. Um, most of the time it doesn't. Uh, so uh, Debian packages are the traditional way of doing things, flat packs, um, snap packages and things like that. The containerized way um, seems to be the modern trend. Um, but um, yeah, for this demo, um, just to keep it s smaller and easy, I'm just uh, installing the dev packages where I can and using the flat packs where um, there is no Debian package. So I believe all these games I can actually put into the games folder now. I'm going to leave Wine Tricks there because it's not technically a game. The Sensible Soccer is. Um, so everything up there. Wine Tricks is more of a utility, so let's put that into Utilities. Um, so to summarise um, Pop! OS, the installation was easy. Um, what I did notice though was um, it's easy as long as you're installing to a fresh PC or overriding the existing operating system. Uh, there doesn't seem to be an option for dual booting. I might have missed it. But um, on this PC, I had no other operating system installed previously. So obviously, it didn't give an, uh, an option for um, dual booting. Uh, but on my other PC, I decided to try and dual boot on that one. Um, and it didn't give an option. Uh, I tried the manual install. Um, but I wasn't sure about the bootloader on that, what it was going to do. So I stopped there because it didn't give clear options to install alongside the Windows one. So, uh, yeah, dual boot may be tricky, uh, but you can always install it as a virtual machine if you prefer to do it that way. Um, from a usability point of view, um, it, there's, there's no need to use the terminal at all. So if you're worried about it, terminal usage, then there's none of that. Uh, for most PC users, um, Pop! OS will be fine. Uh, we've got Office Suite, it's easy to install software. Um, there's development tools. Uh, you've seen I've, I've installed things like Spotify. And if you've got a machine that can run Steam uh, adequately and run Steam games, then that should work as well. And now, let me show you Steam quickly. So if you want to run Linux games in Steam, you just go Steam Settings and then go to Steam Play and then you can just enable Steam Play for supported titles. And you can choose which version of Proton to use. I can I can now play this game. 
and it should run perfectly fine. So for normal desktop use, um, Pop! OS is actually really, really good. Um, it's a bit slow on this PC, it has to be said. That might be this PC. It's got four gigabytes of RAM and a really reasonable CPU, and it's worked fine for other distros that I've used for my reviews. Um, it's a bit like you, Ubuntu is a bit slow as well on this PC, um, but Ubuntu is slow on every PC as from what I can tell. Uh, I'm not sure whether it's the GNOME thing that's making it run slow. Um, you, you saw that the CPU usage was through the roof when I was trying to do um, too much with it. Um, I'm, I'm going to try uh, Pop! OS on my other PC if I can get it on there. Maybe I'll do it as a virtual machine with 8 gig of RAM and it's got a, a far bigger processor in it. So um, as a virtual PC on there, it should be perfectly fine. Uh, hardware support, Bluetooth worked, printer worked. Um, yeah, so all in all, Pop! OS is really good. I can understand why it's high in the list in DistroWatch and it is one to use if you've got a decent enough PC. Uh, if if you want a Windows alternative, you don't want to mess around with things like Manjaro, Endeavor, you're not sure, MX Linux, and even Linux Mint compared to this requires a little bit more terminal time. I I, I can recommend this, uh, but it's if you're wanting to step into the world of Linux so you can customise and do lots of fancy stuff, then this isn't for you. But for um, somebody who just wants to use their PC as a PC, and they they just fell up with Windows. Uh, Pop OS is good, and that's the end of the review. Um, if you want to see more content from everyday Linux user, um, hit the subscribe button and give this video a thumbs up if you liked it. And that's it. See you next time on Everyday Linux User.